الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Today is going to be the final and last class on the formation and development of grammar. In this module, we were not focusing on studying grammar and learning what grammar is. We just wanted to understand the history behind how the Arabic grammar came about and what stages it went through and what did the scholars of grammar, what role did they play? That was the aim for this module. I want to conclude today with speaking about مشاهير العلماء المتأخرين My aim inshallah ta'ala is to speak about the word مشاهير is prominent, famous, scholars of the Arabic grammar. These are the 18 that I think and I believe you will most likely come across their names in the books of grammar. So just to know who they are. I won't go into great details of who they are and their life and their biography because each one by itself can be spoken about for a period of time. But I just want to give you some understanding of who they are. You're going to see these people. You're going to see them on the footnote of grammar books. You're going to read their views even in some books of tafsir. That so and so he held this view and so and so held this view. And some of them actually even have books that you would study their books in grammar. So it's important to know these scholars. And as you can see, this module, we focused a lot on names. صح? We did. And so that shows you how important it is to know names, right? These are the 18, inshallah ta'ala. Now, I have to put out a disclaimer. These 18... I am only speaking about them as grammarians. We're not looking at them from any other perspective. We're only focusing on that these individuals are grammarians who've spoken about grammar, who've discussed grammar, who've explained great books of grammar. Some of them may have, and they actually do have, corrupt belief. And I won't let that slide, I will mention it. Does that make sense? But that doesn't take away that they are Imams in the Arabic language Does that make sense? So I'll touch on that inshallah ta'ala The first one of them is Ibn Jinni Ibn Jinni is the first one His name is Abu Al-Fatih His name is Abu Al-Fatih Uthman ibn Jinni. His father was a slave. His father, ibn Jinni, was a slave by a Roman called Sulaiman ibn Fahd al Azdi. His father. So, ibn Jinni's father was a slave for a Roman master whose name was called Sulaiman ibn Fahd al-Azdi. He was born in Mosul, in Iraq, and he took from the scholars of Mosul. And he came out at a very early stage of his life to go and teach Arabic, or to even educate the people. He came out very early, Ibn Jinni, to teach and to benefit the people. So one day, the great grammarian Al-Farisi, and we spoke about him, we spoke about him, Al-Farisi saw Ibn Jinni teaching. He saw him what? He saw him teaching and educating the people. And Al-Farisi, you asked him a question, a grammar question. And he wasn't able to respond. And he wasn't able to answer. And then he said to him, Tazabbabta wa anta hisrim. And this is before. It's a phrase used for a person who goes forward and pushes himself forward before, he hasn't, before he's reached the ability and the capability of talking. It's a method 
used for the person who pushes himself forward before he reaches the scholars they say anyone who hastens something before its timing he gets prevented from it let's say for example your father's got a lot of wealth and what do you do you're going to inherit him you're going to inherit your father but you can't wait for your father to die so you kill him you've hastened your father's death right then the Sharia what will he do to you it will prevent you from the inheritance so they use that principle for who for the one who tries to hasten the results he wants to go out and teach when he hasn't reached that level yet then they say he will be prevented from what he's trying to attain you really won't get knowledge and that happens to many many people may Allah protect us from it subhanahu wa ta'ala the humbleness of these great scholars was when he got interrogated like that and he got questioned Ibn Jinni by Al Farisi he realized he didn't know and so he said to him can I study from you he said to Al Farisi can I study from you and Al Farisi said you can you can and so he stayed with Al Farisi and he studied from him and he took from him until he died in Baghdad he wrote many books in grammar from them is a, a book called Al Khasais Sirru Sina'ah and he also has a kitab called Al Lum'ah as I said he died in Baghdad when the year was 392 392 second person is Al Zamakhshari Abu Al Qasim Muhammad Muhammad ibn Umar Jarullahi Zamakhshari is a Mu'tazili he's a what? he has the belief of the Mu'tazila and the Mu'tazila are who? they are the ones who said that the Quran is created and they are the ones who gave Al-Imam Ahmed the problem that he went through the Mu'tazila Zamakhshari he is a Mu'tazili and walidhalika the scholars, the scholars, they warned against his kitab, his tafsir book. They warned against his tafsir book. The reason is because Zamakhshari, he reached a high level in the Arabic language. Where did he reach? High level. High level. His eloquency, the Arabic language that he uses, is high and above. And so the way he articulates points, and he brings his message across to people is very persuasive and great scholars like al imam al dhahabi like ibn hajar they said it takes time for anyone to realize when he puts the belief of the mu'tazila in there That's how eloquent he was he would push his views in the most articulate manner that you're reading it and you're actually accepting it and the premise is batil are we all together, brothers? Well, Ibn Hajar and other scholars, they warned against it. And Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah warned against the kitab written by Zamakhshari's tafsir. And it's not a book to go through. There are many tafsir that suffice you from it. Stay away from it. But he has many books. And from his most profound book that the scholars loved in terms of the Arabic language, it is Al-Mufassal. He wrote a kitab called Al-Mufassal. And Ibn Ya'ish, who we're going to speak about soon, explained that book. So it's a highly loved book. His laqab, his nickname was Jarullah, right? Jarullah, the reason why they called him is that because he used to live in Mecca. He lived next to the Kaaba. That's where he resided, they said. For a period of time. And then he went back to his own uh, place or where he was from, which was Khawarizma. The Makhshar. Is a place in Khawarizma. He went back to where he came from originally and he died when the year was 538. 538. The third person is Al Anbari. Abu Al Barakat Abdul Rahman Kamaluddin ibn Muhammad Al Anbari. He was born in Anbar and he took knowledge from his father. And then he went. To Baghdad 
and he took from Ibn Shajari rahimahullah until hatta tabahhara fi ulum al arabiya until he became an ocean in the Arabic language and he authored many books from them is Asrar al arabiya he has a book called he has another kitab called Al Insaf fi Masail al Khilaf bayna al Basriyin wa al Kufiyin he has many other books he died when the year was 577 577 the fourth person is al uqbari al al uqbari abu al biqa abdul rahman al darir al hussein he was born in baghdad and he took grammar from ibn al khashab he took grammar from him and other than him he has many books in grammar from the books in grammar that he has that really made him famous was that he explained the kitab written by Zamakhshari al-Mufassal he explained it he explained that book he also explained the Luma' by Ibn Jinni remember I mentioned Ibn Jinni has a kitab called Al-Luma' he explained that book he also has another kitab called At-Tabiyin Fi Masail al-Khilafi Bayn al-Basriyin wa al-Kufiyin he even explained the Diwan of Al-Mutanabbi, Abu Tayyib Al-Mutanabbi. And it's a very beneficial, very good sharah. He died here when it was 616. 616. Al-Uqburi, he died when the year was 616 Hijriya. The fifth person is Ibn Mu'ti. Ibn Mu'ti, Abu Hussein, Yahya, Zainuddin ibn Mu'ti al-Zawawi Ibn Mu'ti is the man who authored the Alfiya before Ibn Malik You know Ibn Malik rahimahullah when Ibn Malik came and he wrote Alfiya Alfiya meaning a thousand lines in Arabic poetry two subjects what are they? grammar and Morphology. Those two subjects, Al Fit Ibn Malik talks about it. Nahu Sarf. Before him, Ibn Mu'ti came. But he says it himself. He says, Fa'iqatan al fiya tabna mu'ti wahwa bi sabkin ha'izun tafdila mustawjibun tana'i al jamila wallahu yaqdi bihi batin wafira li walahu fi darajati al akhira. He said, My a thousand, Ibn Malik says this. My thousand lines in grammar. And in morphology, is better than the thousand lines written by Ibn Mu'ti. Fa'iqatan al-fiyat Ibn Mu'ti. But look what he couldn't, he couldn't resist to say. He couldn't resist. He had to say, وَهُوَ بِسَبْقِنْ حَائِزٌ تَفْضِيلًا But he surpassed me in timing. So he's virtuous than me. The person who's before you is better than you. وَهُوَ بِسَبْقِنْ حَائِزٌ تَفْضِيلًا مُسْتَوْجِبٌ ثَنَائِيَ الْجَمِيلًا And he has rights on me that I praise him in good. Mustawjib, the rights that Ibn Mu'ti has on me is that I praise him and I mention good, good of him. But my Alfi is better. Are we all together? And it's funny because after him, Suyuti came and he said, Fa'iqatan Alfiya Tabn Maliki. Ujhuri came after and he said, Fa'iqatan Alfiya Tas Suyuti. Many people came after. Each person kept saying, My thousand lines are better than his one. Are we all together? And the scholars, they say, Al-Kamalu Lillahi Azza wa Jalla. The book that no one can say, my book, my words are better than it is who? Kalamullahi Azza wa Jalla. Because Allah said in the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Do they not ponder on, on the Quran? Do they not contemplate on the Quran? وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ if the Quran was to come from other than Allah, لَوَجَدُوا فِي اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا They would have found in it contradiction. But because the Quran is only from Allah, it can't be contradicting. Are we all together? So Ibn Mu'ti, he wrote this Alfiya, which was praised and it was highly loved. He took knowledge from Ibn Asakir. He went to Damascus and he stayed there. And then after that, he went to Egypt. And he sat down to teach in Al-Jami' Al-Atiq. And he also taught 
um, many other books. He has al I just mentioned it. And he died in Qahira. And he was buried next to Imam Shafi'i. He was buried, he's buried right next to Imam Shafi'i when the year was 628. 628 Hijriya. The sixth person is Ibn Ya'ish. Ibn Ya'ish is Abu al-Baqa. Ya'ish, Muwaffaquddin Ibn Ali Ibn Ya'ish. Al-Halabi. He grew up in where? Halab, which is in Syria. He took grammar from the scholars of Halab. And then he went to Baghdad. Then after that to Damascus. Seeking knowledge, trying to benefit. After he gained a great portion of knowledge and he studied the language greatly, he went back to benefit the people. And he has a sharah on the Al-Mufassal by Zamakhshari. He explained it and he died a year 640, 643. The seventh person is Ibn al-Hajib. The seventh person is Ibn, Ibn al-Hajib. Ibn al-Hajib. Abu Amr, Uthman, Jamaluddin, Ibn Umar, al-Kurdiyu al-Asl. Al-Shaheed Ibn al-Hajib. Ibn al-Hajib, who is he? Ibn al-Hajib is the man that Ibn Malik is Alfiya originally came from. The Alfiya Ibn Malik that you're seeing, it came from a, the works of Ibn Hajib. How did it come from it? Ibn Hajib wrote a kitab called Al Kafiya in grammar. He called it Ibn Hajib Al Kafiya in grammar. And then he went, he wrote another kitab called Al Shafiya in sarf morphology. Ibn Hajib did this. He wrote a book called Al Kafiya, and in the Kafiya he spoke about grammar. And then he wrote another kitab called Al Shafiya, and he spoke in the Shafiya what? Sarf, morphology. Ibn Mali came, he combined the two books, and he called it Al Kafiya to Shafiya, and he made poetry out of it. What did he do? He made a, a poetry out of it. Uh, 2,000 something lines. Are we all together, brothers? He called it Al Kafiya to Shafiya. Then Ibn Malik felt the poetry he made from the two books of Ibn Hajib was too big for the people. And so he summarized it in his Al Fiyat Ibn Malik, the Al Fiyat that we have. So the Al Fiyat is a summary of Ibn Malik's own Nazm, which originally came from Ibn Hajib. At the ending of the al what does he say? Ahsa min al kafiyati. Ahsa min al kafiyya. He said, Ahsa min al kafiyati al khulasa. This book is a summary of what is in the khulasa. So he said, Ahsa min al kafiyati al khulasa. Kamaqtada ghinam bila khasasa. Ibn Hajib, he died the year 646 Hijriya. The eighth person is Ibn Mada. The eighth person is Ibn Ibn Mada, Abu Al Abbas Ahmed Ibn Abdul Rahman Al Lakhmi Al Qurtubi. He's from Qurtuba. Qurtuba was once upon a time. I mean, currently it's Spain right now, modern day Spain. Like once upon a time, it was owned by the Muslims. Okay. And the history behind Andalus is something a person should sit down and read. And what took place and how the Muslims... You need to look into Qurtuba and Garnata and Ishbil and all these places. How were they it reached? Even now today, if you go to Spain, you can still see the remnant of the Arab culture still there. And the Muslims who were living there at that time. Ibn Mada, he grew up in Qurtuba in a house which really loved knowledge. So he took the path of the people of his family and he became tabahara fi ulum al arabiya He became an ocean in the Arabic language. He took over qada. He became a qadi at the time of the Amir al muminin Yusuf ibn Abdul Mu'min, who is from Mindawlat al-Muwahideen. He has a kitab called 
كتاب المشرق في النحو يعني اوصى على هذا هذا كتاب كود الرد على النحات الرد على النحات and he's refuting the grammarians from مشرق ها huh? the west صحيح he refutes those grammarians and he died when the year was 592 hijriya 592 hijriya the ninth person is ibn makhruf ibn makhruf his name is abu al-hasan ali ibn muhammad ibn ali al-hadrami al-ishbili ibn makhruf he was born in ishbiliya ishbil again is from where Shbili is where? It's in Andalus. It was in Spain. He took from Ibn Tahir. He took from who? Ibn Tahir. وَبَرَزَ فِي الْعَرَبِيَةِ And he really became an imam in the Arabic language. From his explanation is, he has a sharah on Kitab Sibawihi. He explained it. And when he explained it, the leader of Al-Maghrib, he gave him elf dinar. A thousand dinar. And he also has a shara on Al Jumal, Lizajaji. We spoke about Lizajaji. He has a shara on his Jumal and other books. Number 10, Rida Deen. I'm a Rida. I'm a Rida. I'm a Rida. Muhammad ibn al Hassan, Najmul Milla, Wad Deen, Al Istarabadi. Who explained the two books that I mentioned by Ibn Hajib? Ibn Hajib, what did he write? Al Kafiyah in grammar and Al Shafiyah in sarf. Rida Deen, he explained both of those books. He explained both of them, and a lot of the scholars go back to them. And he had tashayyu in him. He was a Shi'i. And some of the historians actually mentioned he had hate for Umar. He died the year 606. 600 and 86 Hijriya. Ibn Usfur. Ibn Usfur is Abu al Hassan Ali ibn Mu'min al Ishbili. And they praised him greatly when it came to his mutala'a. Wa kana min asbarin nas ala al mutala'a. He was a very patient man when it came to reading. From his books is a kitab called Al Qurab. There's a kitab called Al Qurab. He explained it and he authored it. And he died the year 663. The 12th Imam is Ibn Malik. Ibn Malik, Abu Abdullah Muhammad Jamaluddin Ibn Abdullah Ta'iyu, who was born in Jayyan. And Jayyan is where? It is a place in Andalus. Al Imam Jamaluddin Ibn Malik, you know Ibn Malik, right? The great grammarian. Um, Ibn Malik said about Zamakhshari, he's a, he's a small student of knowledge in grammar. He said he's a baby student in grammar. Who said that? Ibn Malik. Ibn Malik said that Zamakhshari is a what? He's a baby grammarian. Baby. But Ibn Malik has the rights to say that because he was in what? The Siba way of his time. No one was like Ibn Malik when it came to grammar. And he's far greater than Zamakhshari. The Kitab al fiyat ibn Malik is literally the book that has the most service. It's been served the most. There are many shuruh that were placed on it. We're going to speak about one of the grammarians, the last person. His name is what? Ibn Aqil, right? Ibn Aqil explained al fiyat ibn Malik and his sharah is one of the best, if not the best. Are we all together? And many scholars, they placed Hawashi on it. Like on the Kitab al fiyat ibn Malik, many scholars, they've put, and that inshallah ta'ala, we leave it for another time. Ushmuri has a sharh on it. He also has a, he also has a lamiyatul af'al, where he talks about morphology, Ibn Malik. Even though in his al fiyat has a morphology and grammar in there, he wrote a small one for the student. And he said in there, وَبَعْدُ فَالْفِعْلُ مَنْ يُحْكِمْ تَصَرُّفَهُ يَحُزْ مِنَ اللُّغَةِ الْأَبْوَابُ وَالسُّبُلَ فَهَاكَ نَظْمًا مُحِيطًا بِالْمُهِمِ وَقَدْ يَحْوِ التَّفَاصِيلَ مَا يَسْتَحْذِلُ جُمُلَا He mentions anyone who masters these points that he mentions here and learns the morphology 
he will swim deep into the knowledge of the religion. A person who studies morphology will go deep into the religion. Are we all together? Number 13 is Ibn Ajur Rum. Ibn Ajur Rum is the, the author of the Kitab Ajur Rumiya, the Muqaddimah. His name is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Muhammad al Sinhajiyu. Ibn Ajur Rum is his name. Sanhajiyah, I'm a Sanhajah, is a Qabila, is a tribe from Al Maghrib. Ibn Maliki died 672. Ibn Ajur Rum, the name Ibn Ajur Rum, the scholars they say, Bilugatil Barbar, in the Bar- Bar- Barbar language. It means Al Fakir Sufi. Somebody's poor. A Sufi here means a person with aesthetic. You all know what aesthetic means, right? A person who boycotts the dunya and the glamorous and the joy and the glitters of this dunya and he turns towards the akhirah. That's what the word Ajurum means. Okay? He died the year 723 Hijriya. The 14th person is Abu Hayyan Muhammad. His name is Muhammad Athiruddin ibn Yusuf al Garnati. He's very well known as Abu Hayyan al Andulisi. He's from the students of Ibn Malik, took from him, and very well known. And he met Ibn Taymiyyah. He met Ibn Taymiyyah. And he used to love Ibn Taymiyyah at the beginning. But when he met Ibn Taymiyyah, and he and Ibn Taymiyyah had a discussion, they had a a discussion and then he said to Ibn Taymiyyah you don't know this Arabic grammar or Arabic ruling in a particular issue and so Ibn Taymiyyah he was a person who was as Imam al-Dahabi said about him he had hidda in him Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah was a uh, shadid in the way he spoke are we all together but you know Dahabi said even though Imam Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah had hidda in him are you with me? That's staunchness. Lakin yaglibuhu al hilm. What would overcome it? His forbearance. He was a person who had hilm. He can endure what people do to him. That would make people overlook what he, how harsh he was. He would never respond to people's reactions. He would take it in. And he was very forgiving in that regard. So Abu Hayyan al Andulusi must have said to Ibn Taymiyyah in the discussion something. And then Ibn Taymiyyah responded and he said to him, listen. There are matters in grammar, you don't even know them. And Siba way he did some mistakes in his book, that even Siba way he doesn't know that, that I know it. Abu Hayyan got angry. He loved Ibn Taymiyyah before that. And he got angry and from that day he wrote poetries to speak against Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah. So Abu Hayyan al-Andulusi was a great grammarian. He was a great grammarian and he has tafsir of the Quran he has a what a great tafsir book he died a year when it was uh, 745 15 is a shatibi Abu Shaq al-Shatibi there are many shatibis that you need to know there's two famous ones one is Abu Qasim al-Shatibi Abu Qasim al-Shatibi who's Abu Qasim al-Shatibi that's the one who wrote the Qiraat are we all together Hirzul Amani wa Wajhul Tahani the Qiraat that you do, yeah? That's Imam Abu Qasim al Shatibi. Between them is a hundred years. The second one is Abu Abu Ishaq al Shatibi. This is the one we're talking about here. Abu Ishaq al Shatibi is the one who wrote the Kitab al Atisam and he wrote the Kitab what? Al Muwafaqat. He has a ten volume explanation on Al Fiat ibn Malik. 10 volumes and that sharah was published by Jami'at Umm Al-Qura and his doctorat was done on it it was a thesis research 10 volumes and it's rare to find it today I tried hard to find it so I, I, I only read it online as a PDF many of the ma'rads when you ask they don't have it so maybe if a person goes to Mecca and can get me that book, I'll make dua for them. Just keep it in mind, inshallah. But he has this alfiyah. He has an explanation on it. And it's very good. 
The 16th is Ibn al-Nadhim. Ibn al-Nadhim means what? The son of the poet. Who is the son of the poet? This is the son of Ibn Malik. The reason why he's called Ibn al-Nadhim is that Ibn Malik is the Nadhim, the father. Did he not write a poetry? And this is the son of the poet. His name is Muhammad Badruddin ibn Muhammad Jamaluddin ibn Malik. His son was a grammarian. Ibn Malik, his son was a grammarian. And he was an imam in the Arabic language. And he has explanation on his dad's works. He explains his dad's work. And he took grammar from his father. And he, even after he took from his father, he went to Ba'labak and he took more and he benefited more. He has an explanation on his father's Lamiyatul Af'al and his father's Alfiya. He explained them both. <coughs> and he died the year 686. 686. The 17th person is Ibn Hisham. Abu, Abd, Abu Muhammad Abdillahi Jamaluddin Ibn Yusuf Al Ansari. This is who? Ibn Hisham Al Ansari is called. He's really well known as what? Ibn Hisham Al Ansari. You know what Ibn Hisham did? He read Al Fiat Ibn Malik, memorized it, mastered it, learned it. He took it out of poetry and he made it into a nathar, normal book. And he called it Awdahul Masarik. And then he explained it. Does that make sense? Awdahul Masarik ila Al Fiat Ibn Malik. It's the what? It's the poetry of Ibn Because you know, poetry sometimes it's hard to read when you're explaining poetry. Because the poet has to look after a what? A rhythm. There's a qafiyya in the Arabic language that he has to look after. Are you with me, brothers? And so sometimes it's complicated when you want to understand what, what's happening here. Does that make sense? Sometimes there's concepts and things that are done, which is barura shi'riya. Lakin when Ibn Hisham saw that the alfiyya, he thought, okay, let me make it easy for the people. And he made it into a nathr. He took it out of a nathr. He made it into a non-poetic form. And some, so, so some of the scholars, they say this can be considered as a sharah for al fiyat ibn Malik. Does that make sense? Because it's easier to understand which one. Which one is easier to understand? Poetry or a normal speech? A normal speech. But which one is easier to memorize? Poetry. Does that make sense? And knowledge are those two pillars. Knowledge is hivdun wa fahmun. Memorization and comprehension. Does that make sense? If you're not memorizing, then you're missing one of the pillars of knowledge. And if you're not comprehending what you're memorizing, then you're going to be the donkey that's carrying what? That's what you're going to be, the donkey that's carrying books. You're going to be a person who's carrying knowledge, but doesn't know what he's carrying. I told you guys the story of the man who used to be called, they called him Furu' al Himar. Huh? Furu' al Himar. Furu' al Himar. He memorized the Furu' of Ibn Muflih. He knew it from cover to cover. It's a Hanbali text. Ibn Muflih. Ibn Muflih, do you know who he is? Ibn Muflih is the man that came to Ibn Taymiyyah and then he said to him, Who are you? And he said to him, I am Ibn Muflih. And then Ibn Malik said to him, you're not Ibn Muflih. You're not the son of Muflih. You are Muflih yourself. Muflih is a person who's successful. Ibn Taymiyyah praised him greatly. And especially Ibn Taymiyyah praised him for his fiqh. Especially his knowledge of the Hanbali Madhab. And Ibn Muflih's uh, Kitab Al-Furu' There are quotes of Ibn Taymiyyah that you know, are the views that he attributes to Ibn Taymiyyah that you may not find in his Majmur or in Ibn Taymiyyah's other works. So if you want to know sometimes what Ibn Taymiyyah believes, the furu' of Ibn Muflih helps you. As a side point, it was a man who memorized the furu' of Ibn Muflih. All of it. He swallowed it. And they used to call him Himar al-Furu' Because whenever they needed it, they would ask him, hey, read it. You know, this chapter, this page, can you read it from us? And he would read it. He doesn't understand what he's reading. You see, that's not knowledge. And there's another person who's the opposite where if he doesn't have his books, and if he doesn't have his notes, 
Qamat al Qiyamah, the day of judgment has come. He doesn't know what to do. That's also a it's also another problem. So the scholars they said, and the scholars do speak about these issues. If we have to choose, if we have to, if we have to choose, which one is more important? Hivd of fam. If we have to choose. But again, we said we can't because they're two, both of them are two pillars and your knowledge is always going to be weak. No doubt to understand is better than to memorize. If we have to push that notion. But the truth is, Hivr was the first thing our religion started with. Do you, is, is that, wasn't that the case? Are you with me, brothers? Look what Allah said about the Quran. Look, pay attention. Just ponder on this verse with me. Allah said about the Quran, Bel huwa ayat. Hey, what did he say after that? Bel huwa ayatun bayinatun fi suduri ladina utul ilma. Allah said, rather, these are verses, clear cut verses. And they are found and they are present in the chest of who? In the chest of who? The people of knowledge. Some of the scholars they said they are people of knowledge because they have everything in their chest. They told Ibn Hazm rahimahullah, Ibn Hazm, you know Ibn Hazm, right? They told Ibn Hazm because Ibn Hazm was a very, very, very uh, staunch person and he was very vile in some of times the way he spoke. Very sharp tongued. But the scholars they said, if Allah saves you, from the sword of Hajjaj and the tongue of Ibn Hazm, you're safe. Say Alhamdulillah. If Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, Allah saves you from his sword and, he, and Ibn Hazm's tongue or Ibn Hazm's pen, then you're safe. They too were very strong. Ibn Hazm, they informed him that some group, a group of people were burning his works because they didn't like him. Especially he was in Andalus and the madhab that was muntashir at that land was what? The Maliki madhab. Now we all together. The Maliki madhab was spread. And what madhab was he trying to push? The Bahiri madhab. And so he gained a lot of hate and enmity from the people. And so some people started to burn his works and get rid of it. And he said, فَلْيَحْرِقُوا قِرْطَاسِي Let them burn my works. Let them burn my qaratis, what I wrote, and my scrolls and my books. For everything I wrote, I've memorized that I know I can rewrite it. All of it. Ajib, right? All of it is in my chest. I rewrite it. What's the problem? Burn it. You haven't burnt the person who wrote it. Imagine that. Imagine. What did Siba Wei's teacher say? Siba Wei's teacher, Khalil ibn Ahmed al Farahidi, said something very powerful. He said, Laysa al ilmu ma hawahu al qimitru. Knowledge is not what's inside the books. That's not knowledge, he said. Knowledge is what's gathered in the person's chest. What's in your heart, what you have. What, it's what you, when you go to the toilet and you go in there, you don't have no book, you don't have no notes, you have nothing with you. That is knowledge. What is with you at that moment is your knowledge. That is what you can claim. As for the books that are out there, well, everybody can read it with you. Sahih. You can't claim that. So whatever age you're at, brothers, whatever age you're at, don't deprive yourself from memorizing. Walau qaleel. Walau qaleel. And even if it's something very little, bait or baitain, shatl, even half a line of poetry, memorize something. One ayah, memorize something. Train your brain, yourself to memorize. Use different methods. Stick things on the wall. Write it down on a board. Do it in different ways, but memorize. Don't deprive yourself from memorization. If you truly think that you're going to attain knowledge without memorizing, then you're fooling yourself. Then you're what? Then you're fooling yourself. Knowledge is attained with, through memorization. And I'll tell you something. To mem when you memorize something, the understanding has to open for you. صح? Try it. Try it. When you memorize things, you will truly understand it better. Are we all together? And some of you might say, I've tried to memorize and I'm not successful in it and I can't do it and I'm unable to do it. That's not true. 
because what it seems like is your first enemy that you have right now here working against you is yourself. You've already told yourself you can't do it. You've already convinced yourself you can't do it. You can. It's just that you need to learn how do you as an individual memorize. What method works for you. There are some people what works for them is and Allah gifted them like that. They have to see it. It has to be written in front of them. They memorize it. And some people they don't need to see it. They hear it and they memorize it. I'll tell you something. My children, my own children, I was memorizing my muraja'a, my revision on Al-Fiyat ibn Malik. I'm memorizing. So what I did is I finished the first 500 lines, I'm moving on to the next. So I'm doing muraja'a, 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 muraja'a. And so I'm listening to wherever I go. I put the headphones in if I come into somebody's car, if I'm outside, I listen to it, keep listening to it. When I'm not, when I don't have it with me. What I do, I record it on my phone and I listen to my voice all day. Okay? So what I did was when I'm in the car, I, I, I put it on. I connect it to the speakers and I listen. My children, subhanAllah, unintentionally, they memorized it. Well, not the whole entire al but they memorized a great significant part of it. And no one intended to teach them. How? Takrar, repetition. All I had is my son saying, Alam, ismu yu'ayyinu al-musamma mutlaqa, alamu ka ja'farin wa khirniqa, wa qaranin wa adanin wa lahiqi, wa shatqamin wa haylatin wa washiq. Dad, where did you learn this? How did you memorize that? You see, you as an individual may take longer than that child, but wallahi, I'll tell you, you will memorize. You just have to keep going on and on and on. This is the important thing. These scholars, wallahi, the real thing that you see in their life and their biography, and I'm telling you, I've looked at a lot of the, these scholars, their lives. What I saw with them is hifd. Hifd, hafidhu. They memorized. They went home, they put a portion of knowledge that they're going to memorize. Brothers, it's not a race. You don't have to finish the Quran in five years. You don't even have to finish it in 20 years. It's not a race. But just take that path. However long it takes you, it doesn't matter. Do it like him. Put yourself down for it. Just because you're slow, that doesn't mean you dismiss it and you let it go. It just means that you work harder. Are we all together? You're not racing with anybody. If you felt that you tried to memorize it in two years, it didn't work, then make it three years. It didn't work. Four years. Five years. Give yourself more time. No problem. But just don't give up. Just don't give up. Memorize. And start with the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Memorize it. So, Muhammad Badruddin is the son of Ibn Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala. Ibn Hisham, we mentioned who he is, rahimahullah ta'ala. He wrote the kitab, Awdahu al-Masarik. He also has other great books that I want to mention. From them is a kitab called uh, Qawaid al-I'rab. He has a kitab called Qawaid al-I'rab. A, a kitab very beneficial. Lakin Ibn Hisham has a book. If anybody studies this book, he will never ever need to look at any book in grammar. Ever, ever. Never. I'll give you that reassurance. It's, even the name of the book tells you it. The name of the book is Mughni Labib an Kutubil Arib. It's called Mughni Labib. And Kutubil Arib. You know what it means? It means Mughni the Sufficer, if that's even an English word. It means it suffice the Labib, the smart one. From what? And Kutubil Arib, from the books of Arab. Arib is the plural of Arab. Mughni Labib, it suffices the smart one, the clever one. The Labib, Sahibul Lub, the person who has smart, is clever. It suffices him from what? And Kutubil Arib. It suffices you from all the books of grammar if you study this book. They came to Ibn Hisham and they said, Ibn Hisham, you have reached the pinnacle of grammar. No, like you're the Seba wave this time. No one's like you in grammar, like no one of this era. They said to him, Why don't you do Arab of the Quran? Why don't you sit down and grammatically bring Arab of the whole entire Quran? You can do that. From your memory, you can do that. Why don't you do it, Ibn Hisham? 
and he responded fast and effectively and he said I have done something that will suffice anybody from, from me having to do that for them let them just read Mughni al-Labib and Kutub al-Arib let them read this book in other words if you study this book Mughni al-Labib and Kutub al-Arib you can stand over every verse in the Quran and understand the different types of grammatical analysis that are in each verse of the Quran Kalamullah Azza wa and brothers, wallahi, when you learn the grammar in ayat, the grammar in it, and the grammatical rulings that are in each verse, it increases your ability of pondering over the Quran. It will increase it. So he has that book. Rahimahullah rahmatan wasi'a. He died when the year was 761 Hijriya, Ibn Hisham. And he was, uh, he died in Qahira, and he was buried in, outside Bab al-Nasr. When the year was, 761. Last but not least, Ibn Aqil. Last but not least, Ibn Aqil, Abu Abdul Rahman, Abdullah ibn Abdullah Bahauddin, Ibn Abdul Rahman al Halabi. He grew up in Cairo, Qahira, and he took from Al Jalal al Qazwini, Al Abu Hayyan, and other than them. And he sat down to teach in Jami' al Nasiri. Ibn Aqil, he sat down to teach in the big Jami' Jami' al-Nasiri to teach and from the books that he has authored is the famous Sharah of al fiyat ibn Malik, Ibn Aqil. He has a Sharah on al fiyat ibn Malik which has become the first Sharah that anybody will look into. And we all together. And it's the best, the best, the best, the best, the best. Ibn Aqil Sharh of Al-Fit ibn Malik is the best. If you haven't read it, then read it. And scholars, what they did was when they saw his Sharh, they gave a footnote on the Sharh. And they explained his Sharh. And they gave a lot of effort towards his Sharh. For example, the Sharh of um, Sija'i. He has a hashia on it. Hashia on the Sharah. And also hashia to Al Khudari. Hashia to Al Ujhuri. All of these are hawashi that are all placed on the Sharah ibn Aqil. Rahimahullah. Ibn Aqil also was buried next to Al Imam Malik, Al Imam Shafi'i in Cairo. He was buried close to Al Imam Shafi'i when the year was 769. 700. And 69, may Allah have mercy upon these great Imams uh, who brought to us the uh, knowledge of grammar that serves and helps our, our religion. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I just want to make a couple of announcements, inshallah ta'ala. The first thing that I want to say to you all, brothers, is inshallah ta'ala, bi'idhnillah al kareem, we're going to be starting the next, the next module, which will be starting next week. This new module that we're going to be starting, it is new. It has no connection with what was taught before. Every subject, we've, we've closed it. There's nothing that's dragging on from the previous module or from the previous semester. We're starting spanking new. Are we all together? Al Qawaid al Fiqiyah, we're going to be doing. And Usul al Fiqh. And these two sciences, brothers, brothers, it really allows you to understand how the scholars extracted and derived and deducted from the Quran and the Sunnah. You will appreciate the legacy of Al-Islam. How these Imams came thousands, hundreds of years later or even at the time of the Messenger, how the rulings were taken from the Quran and the Sunnah, the history behind that, the formation we're going to be taking that inshallah ta'ala. Also what we're going to be doing is a bonus module. It was thrown in there for you brothers. 
ancestors, the fiqh of family, the fiqh of family. You're going to be studying fiqh al usra. You're going to be studying marriage. And what does Islam say about marriage? What's the wisdom behind marriage? And what are the rights in marriages? Also, you're going to be studying the opposite, divorce. Many people come to me and they ask, I said this to my wife, if she's divorced, I was hang- angry, I was excited, I was this. Are we all together? You're going to also study the chapter of me and my spouse, we, were, we went our separate ways and now we have a child and she wouldn't let me take the child and I want to take the child. All of that, what does the Sharia say regarding it? The custody of the child. And after you divorce the wife and she has children for you, do you dismiss her? Do you forget about her? She ha- you don't have nothing to do with her? Or do you still have to provide for her? And what is it that you need to provide for? And etc. We'll also be speaking about if two people go their separate ways. What kind of relationship I and mean, what kind of uh, contact can they have? What is permissible and what isn't permissible? Issues that are very relevant to 90% of people come to my consultation sessions. The questions they ask me about family structure, I will be discussing in this, inshallah ta'ala, in Fiqh al-Usra. Sheikh Ibn Baz, the great Mufti of Saudi Arabia, who died, was asked, Sheikh Ibn Baz, you have a lot of questions put to you. People ask you questions continuously. What is the most asked question? What is the frequent asked question? And he said divorce. Divorce is the most asked question. And I could say my family structure is the most asked question. Brothers, I'll say something to you. What's the most important organ in the human body? Huh? The most important organ of the human body is the heart. Ibn al-Qayyim said the most important part of the community is the household. Just the same way that if the heart becomes tainted, then the whole body parts are becoming tainted. And the whole body parts are destroyed. If the household is destroyed, then the whole community will be destroyed. Another benefit. Al-Izm ibn Abdi Salam has a kitab called Qawaid al-Ahkam. I was fascinated when I came across this. He mentioned in that book, that book, it talks about the benefits and the harms. It talks about masalih and mafasid. What are benefits and what are harm? And how do you weigh what's beneficial and what is harmful? And what about if you're in a situation where the benefit and the harm are the same? And etc. He teaches you principles. And one thing he mentioned, really touched me. He said that the rights that the community have on you, the community, the rights that they have on you, your neighbor, the one in front of you, the community that you're from, the rights that they have upon you is you nurture and you cultivate your child accordingly. Haq that the community have on you. Why? When he grows up, if he becomes prosperous, if he becomes successful, if he becomes noble, he's going to help and he's going to push forward his community. And he's going to be an asset to his community, not a liability. He's going to be an asset to the community, not a liability. But if he becomes corrupt, if he becomes a thief and a thug and a gangster, then he's going to rob the community. So this is the rights that the community have on you. So many people ask, how can I nurture my son correctly? Inshallah ta'ala, fiqhul usra. We'll talk about that in great details. We'll bring some quotes. And all of that will be, inshallah ta'ala, practical. Things that you can go and practice in your life, your household. And in your life, questions that people ask, I want to get married. What is it that I need to look for in a marriage? A sister will say, I want to get married. What is it that I need to look for in a marriage? Should I look for a brother who has biceps and triceps on his ears? Or what should I look for? What should I not look for? Are we all together, brothers? This is the problem. So we need to, inshallah ta'ala, if you can't come for whatever reason it is, then inshallah ta'ala at least inform another person the one who calls others to good he gets the reward of it if you know a, fa- a newly married individual family 
two, two spouses who are newly married or a person who's thinking about getting married then inshallah ta'ala this is going to be beneficial for them why because it's not one day dawra it's going to be a long term meaning it's going to be six hours okay six different sessions we're going to have inshallah ta'ala the last and final announcement that i want to make is we have our tafsir tonight in masjid an nur in Qusais, we have our tafsir of Juz Amma. We are on Surah Al Fajr. In Rabbaka la bil is where we stopped. Then we're going to carry on from there, inshallah ta'ala. And this tafsir is Juz Amma. So it's last portions of Juz Amma. The reason is because we want all of you to be able to understand what you're reading. Because the overwhelming majority of people have really memorized up to there. Or they've, they've heard of it. So to know its meanings. So try to come. It's Friday night. Bring your family, your wife, your children. Bring them. They'll benefit. And if you feel like you may not understand, hypothetically, which I personally think it's very simple, but if you think you may not understand and it's complicated and it's hard for you and you don't understand it, then come at least. The angels are going to descend on you. The Prophet said, Majalasa qawmun majlisan. A people do not sit in a gathering which they sit. Yatluna kitab Allah, they read the book of Allah. Wa yatadarasuna fi ma baynahum. And they are studying amongst themselves. Illa nazalatumus sakina. Tranquility descends on them. Wa hafatumul malaika. And the angels revolve around them. Place their wings on them to protect them. Wa hafatumul malaika. Wa dakarahum Allahu fi man indah. And Allah mentions them in his gathering. Imagine that. Allah says, look at those slaves. They've left the dunya. They walked away from everything else. They could have done so much worldly joy. And they've chosen to really study my, my book and my words. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُ And then the Prophet said, Allah says, وَمَنْ بَطَأَ بِي عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ Anyone whose actions delays him your actions do not allow you to reach your goal, then your lineage and where your background, that won't help you. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka tubu ilayk.